This is the Dell XPS M2010. It's from 2006, and while this may shock some viewers, I think this is a good computer. You see, I'm not the first person to cover this thing. It's been kind of a meme for a while, but it feels like the first thing anyone does is make fun of it. It's always dumb, insane, or monstrous, but I just think it's a good design. Never for me, I wasn't the target audience, but for the person this is intended for, it's a brilliant original concept that tackles a whole range of consumer desires in a cost no object fashion, up to and including inventing whole new approaches to human interface that wouldn't reappear for years, if at all. So. I wanna give you a tour, top to bottom, and show you not just the technical qualities and not just what makes it weird, but what I think would have delighted the market that Dell had in mind. Of course, there is one thing we have to get past first. It is indeed a laptop. You can fold the screen down, it has latches that hold it closed, and you can pick it up by the leather-wrapped carrying handle and take it with you somewhere. It runs off a DC brick, and it even has a battery, which actually works better than you'd think. So this machine really can be used on the go, but I have to admit up front that I'm not sure why that is. I think the battery compromises this machine in several ways. We'll talk about that later, but I still don't think that it makes it worthy of ridicule. But I admit, it's impossible not to giggle at it at first. I mean, once you learn that this is a laptop, the obvious joke is, imagine using that on your lap. But let's be fair, how many other machines can we say that about? Would you want to use my Toshiba Cosmio on your lap? This would probably crush your legs or give you first degree burns, assuming it managed to run long enough on battery to even get hot. The fact is though, the term laptop has been inaccurate basically since it was created. How many machines ever get used on someone's lap? And it's not really clear why we use it because there's always been better alternatives. Consider the term notebook, for instance. The earliest use I could find was by Epson, describing their HX20 computer back in 1982. So that's pretty far back there. And literally four words later, InfoWorld describes it as lap-sized. So it's very possible that both terms were born on pretty much the same day, and they've been fighting for dominance ever since. And the really wild thing is that Epson machine didn't even fold. The modern clamshell design didn't show up until the grid compass a year later. And at the same time, the PC industry has a rich history of portable machines that aren't notebooks. From the luggable compact that sparked off the clone market to begin with, to Dolce's lunchbox machines, and continuing into the 2000s with shuttles and LAN party cases with big handles on top, none of these machines folded either, or had batteries. You were expected to tote them somewhere and plug them into the wall. And when we think of this machine in those terms, as a modern luggable, it makes a lot more sense. In fact, that's exactly what CNET wrote about it at the time, almost verbatim. And, okay, I'm still not exactly sure where Dell imagined you would lug this thing, but that's a question for the end user. We'll worry about it later. For now, let's just look at what it is and what it offers. The industrial design is unlike anything I've ever seen before. It's a completely unique form factor. It may look sort of like a throwback to 80s home computers like the Apple II where the keyboard is built into the chassis, but in fact, the computer is just this wedge back here. The front half is actually a separate unit that's held onto the machine with spring catches, so you can pull it loose and use the keyboard and trackpad independently over Bluetooth. And before you ask, yes, the screen still latches shut with the keyboard removed because there's two sets of latches, one for either half of the machine, and some kind of ingenious mechanism that deploys those latches automatically as you lower the screen. Also, while most Bluetooth peripherals of the time ran off double A's, this one actually uses a lithium ion battery. It's like a little baby laptop pack, except with a really long screw holding it in for some reason. It's adorable and it also still works perfectly. Also, since this docks to the PC, Dell put contacts on the back that made up with these and keep the thing charged automatically. It's incredibly slick, especially with the included trackpad. Now, of course, most people consider a trackpad less than ideal for a desktop PC, but that's okay because Dell included a normal optical mouse as well, which also connected over Bluetooth. Now, I should admit this, I think this peripheral is incredibly clever for reasons we'll go into later, but it doesn't have the best ergonomics. Trackpads were pretty much universally bad at this point in time. For some reason, nobody made a good one, and it's made worse by Dell using these buttons with the weird raised rubber ridge. They really liked these back then, but they're just awful. And it's one of the only real misses on the entire machine, but 
it is still usable in a pinch. The keys are also not full height. I think they're a little bit taller than what you get on a contemporary laptop, but still not that great. They're also membrane, of course, but everything was back then. And the layout isn't what I wish it was. They did do an admirable job of finding a place to shove in the touchpad. I've seen this done worse, but still, I have kind of a hard time typing at full speed on this thing. You know what, actually, uh, when I tried this at home, I was working on a much smaller desk and my error rate was way higher, but now that I've got this space to work with, okay, it's not perfect <laughs> to be sure, but it's a lot better than uh, what I thought. And if I wasn't trying to type that fast, I actually would have a much better opinion of this keyboard. So I take it back, it's actually pretty damn good. Now, any full contact computer user still would have wanted something better, but I don't think that's who this was for. This is for the pure middle of the road consumer and for them this would have been fine and it really could have been a lot worse. Likewise, removing the keyboard could make the PC look pretty awkward, but instead, I think this looks almost like a high-end stereo component. You know, you're, you're banging Olufsen Bayo Center sort of thing. The styling is pretty solid. If they'd gone with the then popular shiny piano black trim like HP was doing, this would look cheap, dated, and beat to hell at this point, but instead, they used brushed anodized aluminum and it still looks terrific. In the center, we have the optical drive, and that feels even more like European stereo gear. The controls are all touch sensitive, which is kind of a bummer, but it was also the style of the time. They do at least give plenty of visual feedback. And when we hit eject, it lifts the drive up to accept a disc. And when we put a disc in, it lowers it back down automatically. And then we can see the disc spinning up through a window on the top. We'll be looking a lot more in depth at the hardware later, but I'd just like to note right now, this is a custom drive, okay? That's weird. The majority of desktop and laptop optical drives are completely generic with at most a little bit of plastic trim on the front, but this actually uses a special slot loading optical drive with a window built into the top. I'm sure that's not an off the shelf part. Dell almost certainly had to commission that from TIAC. So we haven't even made it halfway through the outside of the machine and we're already looking at two completely bespoke components that you couldn't get anywhere else. It's ridiculous. Next up we have the monitor, which is 20.1 inches. <laughs> you shouldn't even make laptops smaller than that. And you know, I was gonna convert this into centimeters, but then I got this chill down my spine when I realized that I've never heard anybody say, oh yeah, I have a 38 centimeter MacBook. So yeah, I looked it up and it seems like laptop manufacturers only use inches no matter where you are in the world. That's weird, right? So this is an enormous display, but to be clear, it wasn't unique. The Acer Aspire 9800 was being sold at the same time with the same size screen, although it used a conventional laptop form factor, which CNET panned as totally impractical. And not much later, HP came out with the HDX 9000 Dragon, a machine that's Pretty clearly a response to this one. It does split the difference though between the XPS and the Aspire design, but once again, it had the same size screen. I suspect, in fact, that they all used literally the same panel. The XPS and the Dragon seem to use the exact same LG part number, and while the Acer doesn't, I wouldn't be surprised if they were just rebranding the same panel because it's very hard to find any other screens with this size and aspect ratio. See, this is a 16 by 10 display, and that's a ratio that I, I think was more popular in the 2000s. It's definitely still around now, but it's what I had in my first LCD monitor in like 2003, and it's a neat ratio. There are advantages to the slightly increased vertical real estate, especially for productivity, but it's an odd choice here because all three of the machines I just named were multimedia powerhouses. The HP Dragon had a media center remote that snapped into the palm rest next to the keyboard. The Acer had a built-in HD DVD player. And as I'll be proving throughout this video, the M2010 was definitely intended for watching TV and movies, for which a 16-9 ratio would be a much better fit. The resolution is also a bit surprising. It's only 1680 by 1050. And don't get this twisted, 2006 was still early for HD adoption, but for the market segment that this was aimed at, full HD was definitely an option. Dell themselves were selling an XPS M1710 at the exact same time that had a 1920 by 1200 panel. So this not being full HD seems tough to swallow. Sure enough, CNET thought it was an absurd limitation when they reviewed the HP Dragon a year later. 
But as far as I can tell, this happened because nobody ever made a full HD 20 inch panel. I've searched and I could not find a single one. You could get smaller or bigger, but 20 inch displays were either 1680 by 1050 or 1600 by 900, no other options. That seems weird, but I guess they were stuck with it. Dell couldn't go any bigger without the machine becoming cartoonishly large. So this is what they were stuck with. In its defense though, it's pretty damn good for the era. Compared to some contemporary machines that I've seen, it's bright as hell, it's incredibly clear and crisp, and the off-axis viewing is excellent. Or to put it more simply, while using the machine, I have not noticed that it's not full HD. The resolution has never bothered me, and I doubt it bothered many people at the time. So I see why they made the compromise, it's just weird that they had to. Also, to their credit, Dell did their best to make the display ergonomic. The huge aluminum linkage back here uh, articulates in not just one, but two places. So you can position this monitor higher or lower or tilt it up and down. You could even conceivably use it while standing. And in the lowered position, it's scooted a lot closer to you than it is in the rear position here. So this is no Ergotron to be sure, but it's more flexible than any other portable computer that I'm aware of. So I have to call this monitor excellent. I guess since we're looking at the monitor, I do have to mention the webcam. This was the early era of Skype calling and whatnot, so it does include one and it is total crap as you'd expect. This is what the webcam looks like under heavy studio lighting. So you can imagine what it was like in a normal environment. <sighs> Oof. Also, no, I have no idea what DocuSign Impact is. I got this at the thrift store for like a dollar. It's basically junk, but what else is new? What isn't junk, however, is the audio situation. This machine rocks a nine speaker sound system, which is unparalleled maybe by everything. Like has anybody made another portable computer with that many drivers? I certainly haven't seen one. And you haven't either so far, since there's only eight up here. The uh, ninth is a subwoofer on the bottom. I'll show you that later when we take it apart. But in short, this system sounds amazing for what it is. The speakers are tiny, and there's only so much you can do by adding more of them, whatever Bose wants you to believe. But this beats any laptop and most desktop speaker sets that I've ever heard. Now, obviously, this being a YouTube video, it's hard to demonstrate that. You'll just be hearing it through a, a Monaral vocal mic, but we'll do our best. Here's a couple samples. Take my word for it, this system sounds so good that while I was working on this script, there were a few moments where I played a song to test something and I just left it playing my library on shuffle while I did other stuff because it just sounded really good. And that's a hell of a compliment for a portable computer, especially of this age. So there's a lot more to look at, but let's just pause for a moment and sum up our first impressions because I think those are the most important thing here. As a person with money burning a hole in their pocket in 2006, you know, pre-housing crisis, you walk into Circuit City and you see this thing on display. Walking up to it, you see a screen that's as bright and sharp as your brand new HDTV, and it feels almost as big, at least compared to other computer monitors. It also looks like a piece of high-end AV gear. It's got brushed metal highlights and no visible cables, right? So you use the wireless mouse to open Windows Media Player and you play a demo song and it sounds better than the Bose Wave stereo you have in your kitchen. You're gonna be pretty stunned by this, I promise. There was nothing on the market that stood out the way this machine did. You're not gonna think, what a silly laptop. You're gonna think, wow, this could replace my entire AV center. And that's definitely what Dell intended. The M2010 came with a whole raft of accessories, without which you can't really get the full picture, literally, as you'll see. So let's go through the ports and slots on this thing, and at the same time, we'll see what goes in them. Starting on the right side, we've got a FireWire port, or as Sony would have called it, iLink, since it's the smaller four pin plug. Now, it might seem odd that uh, Dell didn't put the larger plug on there, but Sony was pushing iLink really hard uh, throughout the 2000s since they made both PCs and camcorders. And, you know, transferring video from your camcorder was really the only function that most PC users saw for FireWire, so they probably had a lot of four pin to four pin cables, and that's probably why Dell chose the smaller plug. And besides ingesting video, you could also pull in photos from your digital camera with the built-in readers for SD, memory stick, XD picture card, and over here, CF. And since this came with Windows Movie Maker and the drive is a DVD burner, this machine is basically ready to go for most forms of contemporary content creation. 
There's also an express card slot where you could add whatever expansions you needed. And I have a suspicion that what Dell really thought you'd put in there was a cable card. But to save everyone four minutes, I'll just put my theories on that in the description since they're probably wrong anyway. Moving around the back side, we've got a phone jack here because it was 2006 and dial-up was still around. And then we have an ethernet port because it was 2006 and dial-up was dying. But then we have DVI and this might seem a little out of place. You'd think a device that was media focused would have had HDMI, but that took a while to get fully off the ground, especially in PCs. You pretty much couldn't get a graphics card with HDMI in 2006, so most commercial TVs and projectors still had DVI inputs. In fact, if we look at a contemporary Samsung TV, the ports are labeled HDMI slash DVI. Samsung knew that PCs wouldn't have HDMI, but the standards were compatible. You could connect them with a passive adapter. And of course, a lot of people hadn't even upgraded to displays with any kind of digital input yet. So DVI's ability to be adapted to VGA was another good reason to include it on the machine. Now, this next port here, that's the AV port, and that's another acknowledgement of the complicated display ecosystem of this era. If you hadn't yet upgraded to an HDTV, you could plug in your standard def set here over S-Video, or you could get an adapter cable that would convert it to composite. Now, both ran at 480i, which was showing its age for sure, but I can tell you that in 2006, seeing your PC show up on a TV at all still made you feel like a king among men, even if it was some awful, 852 by 480 EDTV like I had. Now, if you had one of the really early HD sets though, you could use a different dongle, this guy here, to get analog component. That wasn't quite as sharp as digital, but it would run 1080. And I can tell you, it looked more than good enough for the time, okay? Especially since the TVs that required it were often 720p or rear projection based. So we've got lots of AV ins and outs so far. This is looking pretty good, but it's not that remarkable. Lots of laptops had adapters like this, but we're not done yet. Coming around the left side, we've got two USB 2.0s, and then we've got mic and headphone jacks, and then a Bluetooth pairing button for the keyboard. That's an interesting feature. I'm not sure I've ever seen a physical pairing button on a PC before. I'm not sure why, it seems like a good idea. Now, before HDMI, you couldn't get audio and video out of your computer in the same plug. So whatever you were using to hook up to your TV, you'd need to get the audio out separately. Now this headphone jack could be adapted to RCA to plug into your TV or your stereo receiver, but it's not line level, it's pre-amplified, and it's only stereo. So if you're watching a DVD with 5.1 audio and you have a surround sound system, you don't wanna get overdriven 2.0 audio instead. So that's why when we come around the back here, next to the uh, two additional USB ports, we also have this odd thing. This connector looks a lot like DisplayPort, uh, which had actually just come into existence in 2006. Fortunately, however, the plugs aren't actually the same because this actually goes to a Dell AV breakout box, which offers 7.1 audio, digital SP diff, and two outputs for IR blasters, which I'll touch on in a moment. And to complete the look, the final accessory that Dell included was a TV tuner, either ATSC or DVB, depending on where you were. I'm not 100% sure that this was the exact model that came with this machine since it didn't work with the driver from the Dell utility disc, but it sure looks like the one that PC Magazine got and a tuner is a tuner, so it doesn't much matter. The important thing is that with this, we now have all the pieces of the puzzle. The M2010 is incomplete unless you have all of the ins and outs, which pretty much covers all the in and out that you could possibly want for this era. So let's take a short look at how this would all come together. So obviously I don't have the need or the space to hook this up to a stereo receiver and a, a TV and whatnot. You can imagine you'd plug this into your whole AV center, right? Now software wise, I've tried to set this machine up almost exactly as it would have shipped. So it's got Windows XP Media Center Edition 2005. As was typical for the time, this did include the Vista Ready badge. And when Vista was released a few months later, Dell did switch to it on the 2010, but this machine had the XP COA. So that's what I stuck with to my detriment as you'll hear later. I don't have the full list of software that would have shipped on this thing, but I've installed everything that was on the Dell Utilities disc, and their machines tended to be pretty light on bloatware. From the few screenshots that I can find, I see Microsoft Office, one or maybe two CD burning tools, Adobe Acrobat, Windows Media Center, and Media Player, and not a lot else. So I've stuck with a pretty minimal setup on here, and I didn't bother installing Office. I did install Power DVD though, since it absolutely would have had that, if for no other reason than to enable Windows Media Center to play DVDs. We also have a number of games, and we'll get to those later, but the focus of any Media Center PC is the Windows Media Center app itself. 
I've talked about Windows Media Center several times before and it's largely self-explanatory, so we're just gonna kinda gloss over it. We'll uh, go and fire it up from the icon here. and it launches into a full screen interface. Uh, that's what we call a 10 foot UI because you can use it from 10 feet away and still see what you're doing. So from here, we can do everything you would want to do on a media center PC. We can uh, play music, we can look at pictures, uh, we can play the videos that we've edited together from our camcorder footage, uh, and we can play DVDs. Now, most of these modes you can probably imagine, so we'll just pick a couple like uh, the DVD functionality. Let's put a disc in. And it shows right up. We can just pick a chapter here. This is the Dell XPS M1210, and it's completely unremarkable. So like I said before, the audio sounds great, the video is clear, no real notes, except for the fact, of course, that because this is a 16 by 10 screen, we've got a good solid inch of letterboxing top and bottom. But like I said, there wasn't a whole lot Dell could do about that. One of the biggest features of Media Center though was the TV mode. It's pretty much meant to replace a TiVo. So you'd have this sitting next to your TV wired into your antenna and that's what I've got here. I've got the tuner hooked up to an antenna and I think I'll actually be able to pick up a couple of channels here. So let's get this guy ready. Now this version of Media Center apparently has no ability to automatically scan for digital channels. So I actually had to go in here and program them in by hand. So I think I've got like Fox and PBS and not much else. Uh, well, we can't get Kiro. Let's see what else we got in here. No dice on me TV. Let's turn this unlabeled knob. Does that do anything? No, it doesn't seem to. All right, let's try another channel. Okay, there we go. We got Fox. Wow, that actually worked really well. Oh no, not so well actually. Well, that's the HDTV experience in a nutshell. It either works perfectly or not at all. Definitely an upgrade. That made things so much better. Thank you, ATSC Commission. Anyway, like I said, this is supposed to replace a TiVo, so if we come down here and hit pause, it'll pause live TV and start buffering it onto the hard drive, and then we can just uh, play it back whenever we come back from the bathroom or whatever, or we can hit record here and it'll just start recording it to the drive and we can come back later and watch a whole episode whenever we want. Uh, also, if there was TV guide data available, obviously they took those services down eons ago, uh, we'd be able to go in and tell it to record, you know, every episode of Law and Order or whatever. Also, you remember earlier I mentioned you could plug IR blasters into the AV breakout box? Those were little infrared LEDs that you'd stick to the front of your cable or satellite box, and then if you have a scheduled recording, Media Center can use those to turn on the box, dial in a channel, and then turn it off again when it's done recording. It was all very slick. So as you can see, this really could replace your entire AV center. Your CD player, your DVD player, and even your TV tuner and TiVo could all go into this one machine. But of course, that's just the raw feature set, right? Like any Media Center PC could do all that. We wanna talk UX. We're sitting right in front of this thing. Definitely not the intended experience. If this is a 10 foot UI, how's it perform from 10 feet away? Well, that's a very interesting question on this computer in particular. You see, all Media Center PCs came with a standardized answer to this problem. It was the Media Center remote. Microsoft mandated these things and every vendor had their own design. I've got a few here. They're all slightly different, but largely the same. They were required to have certain things in common, like the enormous green Media Center button here that uh, basically just opens the program and acts as a back button. Now these shipped with every machine that came with Media Center, but they had two limitations. One is that they were infrared, so your machine needed a receiver, which was usually one of these obnoxious little boxes that had like a 15 foot USB cord and there's no way to hold it down. So wherever you put it, it has a tendency to sort of slurp itself off behind your cabinetry. Uh, and also you needed line of sight to this thing. So you couldn't, you know, pause your music from the kitchen or whatever. And secondly, these remotes offer no way to interact with any software outside of Media Center. The remote just does nothing in the rest of Windows. Dell solved both these problems in very unusual ways. First, of course, we've got the wireless keyboard. Since this is Bluetooth, you could carry it into the kitchen and use the playback controls on the right side. These are duplicates of the ones on the chassis, which tells us that Dell didn't make this wireless just to help declutter your desktop. You were expected to use this from the sofa. Uh, the trackpad is more evidence of same. It seems redundant when you first see it since they did ship a normal mouse, but this is really the only kind of pointing device that you can use while balancing it on your knee. I mean, there's track points, but a lot of people don't like those, myself included. 
So with this keyboard in hand, you can control any software on your PC from a distance, filling in the gap that was left by the normal Media Center remote. Of course, on that note, the keyboard and mouse aren't very good at controlling Media Center itself, but again, Dell wasn't satisfied with the usual solution. The M2010 also included a Media Center remote, but it's what Dell calls their premium remote. And let me tell you, that's underselling it. This thing is beyond premium. I'd say it's more impressive than everything else about this computer combined. It's utterly singular, as far as I know. It's the actual subject of this video, and I can't believe I'd never heard of it. At a glance, it just appears to be another Media Center remote. You've got the uh, Media Center Jewel, you've got the playback controls, but that's where the resemblance ends. For one thing, check this out. Let's uh, dial in some TV here. Yeah, dial in, that's what people say about TV. Definitely, that's normal. If I put this thing under the desk, I can still pause my program because it's not infrared, it's RF. But it still has an IR transmitter on the front because it's also a universal remote and a learning one to boot. You can look up a list of codes for it or you can just point your existing TV remote at the receiver on the bottom and it'll clone the signaling. Now, I don't think this feature was fully unique. There seemed to be other Media Center universal remotes, but I'm not sure any of them had learning capability. There was also one RF remote from X10, but it also wasn't IR. So I think the combination of the two is unique. Now, it does only support one device, uh, your TV, and that's a bit of a bummer. It'd be nice if it could control more things, but in theory, you wouldn't have any more things, right? Just your TV and your Dell. This is enough to let you turn the set on and off, change the inputs and control the volume, and everything else should be happening on your PC. It's called Convergence, bub, and you better learn to like it, because it's, it's worth it. Honestly, it's, it's worth it. People who got this working loved it. The next feature, though, is definitely unique. Right above the Media Center Jewel is a motion gyration button, and real heads know what this is and have been spitting at their monitors in shock for several minutes. Sorry, I had to do it my way. Even with Windows Media Center having a fully 10 footified UI, you sometimes just have to mouse around anyway. Once in a while, you're gonna run into something that isn't doable from the remote or that's just way too tedious. Now the wireless keyboard combo solves for a lot of that, but if you're sitting on the couch channel surfing, you don't wanna haul along this whole boat anchor just in case you need to clear a pop-up. So to solve this, the Dell remote integrates a gyroscopic mouse based on the gyration design. There's an accelerometer in here, and when we press this button and wave the remote around, it moves the mouse cursor, much like a Wiimote. Now, this was not a unique feature on its own. Gyration had been selling mice that worked this way since the 90s, but none of them were built into a remote control as far as I know. Now, I don't want to mince words. This is not the most pleasant thing to use. Gyration's normal air mice were actually quite a bit nicer. They had a trigger on the bottom, so you could just squeeze to enable movement and then click with your thumb. But here, the trigger's on the top next to the mouse buttons. To drag and drop, for instance, you have to press the button, mouse over what you want, roll your thumb onto the mouse button, and then hold them both down while you drag. It's really quite a strain on the muscles, uh, but it is at least doable, and that's way beyond the Call of Duty here. It's funny because I was, I was dragging a Battlefield icon, and I said Call of Duty. That's hilarious. The fact that you can clear a goddamned Power DVD automatic update dialog without getting up and fetching the keyboard is more than good enough. Everybody had this problem back in the day. This thing is really a breathtaking achievement just for that reason, but then there's more going on with it. We've got two utterly unique and one nearly unique feature all packed into one remote. So Dell is batting a thousand here, but if you can bat 1200, they did that too, because we're not done. Brace yourself for feature number four. If I press the music button here, that is my Windows Media Player library, and I can navigate through this on the remote itself, pick an artist, pick an album, play a song, without ever touching the computer. This means that even if I can't see the PC, if I'm in the kitchen prepping dinner, I can dig through my music and pick a song and start playing it without needing the TV on or the laptop screen open or even being able to see the computer because it shows you everything you need to know, including the playback status directly on the remote itself. Folks, I have never seen anything even a tiny bit sort of remotely like this. Remotely, yeah, that's good, that's good. I didn't even script that. When I saw this feature, I just about pissed myself. This is the most 2000s thing I've ever seen. It's the most ambitious, ostentatiously ambitious thing that I've ever seen. It deserves more adjectives. This is an overreach of epic proportions and I adore it. 
In 2006, we were all still pretty astonished by the existence of the MP3, being able to select anything from your entire music library almost at the speed of thought was still an incredibly hot topic, and the idea of being able to do it with a dedicated remote terminal like this is astounding. I, I mean, even now, really, and it's done really well too. It doesn't interfere with someone using the computer. There's no like, huge copy of Music Match Jukebox filling the screen. It opens Windows Media Player in a hidden state and controls it via APIs. In fact, if we go in and open the normal Windows Media Player, when we go in and pick a song, we can actually see that song get selected and start playing in Windows Media Player itself. There's actually an updated version of the drivers that even integrates with iTunes and you know, missing that on the first release in 2006 sucks pretty bad, but they did at least do it eventually, right? This feature floors me in a way that nothing really has since the great modern stagnation began. Basically, you know, this is the stuff that we could come up with before smartphones made it all pointless. I'm sure that by 2012, you could control iTunes on your iMac using an app on an iPhone, and I don't know, maybe you could even do that in like 2009, but there couldn't have been many ways to do it, if any, in 2006 or 2007, and not like this, not with a portable, readable, backlit screen. I, I mean, this is simply inspired. Dell stood back, took a look at the problems that still hadn't been worked out with Media Center PCs and said, we aren't going to sleep until we've nailed this as well as anyone can nail it. They saw where Microsoft had left gaps with the standard remote and they filled them. Honestly, I wasn't joking when I said this was the real subject of the video. I wasn't really sure that I had anything to say about this machine, and then I saw the remote and that clinched it for me. This is the M2010. This is the experience. This is what Media Center was supposed to mean. There was so much energy poured into all the marketing behind this, and unlike the stuff that companies pour their marketing into now, this is something everyone viscerally and enthusiastically wanted, and Dell delivered on it. That's the experience. This machine fully converges your entire media center into one device, it integrates with your TV and your stereo, whether they were new or old, and it offers a whole sliding scale of human interface options to fit whatever you wanna do. Whether you're sitting on the couch channel surfing, watching a movie, or playing music while you fix dinner, Dell tried to meet you where you were, literally. But as it turns out, they didn't even stop there. Magazines actually referred to this machine as the showstopper, and they implied that this was actually used in Dell's marketing material. So Dell clearly intended for this to be a powerhouse, and it's no surprise that the hardware specs are not half bad. I figured we'll just go over those while we examine the insides of the machine. I had to take it all to pieces before I could start shooting this video anyway, so I recorded the whole process. If you don't feel like watching, that's fine. Just skip to the next chapter, I'll summarize. One of my favorite things about this machine is that it's actually pretty serviceable. I expected it to be a real struggle though, so on my initial attempt, I overdid it. I started on the bottom, I pulled the battery, which says it's in good health, by the way. Then I pulled the cover off the subwoofer, which is of course a very funny name for a two inch speaker, and there was nothing under there except the subwoofer itself and the Bluetooth module. That's it on the left, the little gold squiggle there is the antenna. Keep that in mind, that'll come up again later. Next, I tried pulling the big access hatch that revealed the Wi-Fi card which was 802.11g, of course, since N wouldn't come out for a few more years. Then there were two RAM slots with two gigs of DDR3. And finally, a normal CR2032 CMOS battery. Not some bizarre proprietary module wrapped in heat shrink, but just a normal coin cell. It was, of course, incredibly dead, but it was easy to replace. Intriguingly, there's also a spot for a second mini PCIe slot, but there's no socket installed. I'm really curious what that might have been, but the service manual says nothing about it. There is an antenna cable laying there, but Wi-Fi and Bluetooth are accounted for, so I have to assume this was for a cellular modem. And that's all there is on the bottom. There's no way to get any further inside, so at this point I realized I should probably get the service manual. And as it turns out, the actual disassembly procedure is much simpler than I expected, and kind of clever, but very obtuse. You'd never figure it out on your own. There are two slots on the back that look almost like Kensington locks, but if you insert a screwdriver and push real hard, the top plate will pop loose. You then repeat this on the other side, and with both plates removed, you can now get to the 13 screws which hold the whole thing together. Removing those is very tedious, but fortunately they're all the same size, so you can't mix them up. After removing those, the top lifts off, and of course you have to be careful to avoid tearing the ribbon cables, but unlike some machines, they're reasonably long and they unplug very easily. 
This opens up the whole inside of the system. But before we get to all that, I wanted to show you this top panel because it's kind of impressive. It's all one enormous hunk of cast magnesium, uh, apparently using an alloy called AZ91D as per the mold stamp. Matweb.com says that's the most commonly used magnesium alloy. So there's a fact for you. The lid latches are also really overbuilt. They secure the top panels with six lugs each and the springs are really heavy. This whole thing feels like an engineer flex because plastic tabs really would have been just fine. But what I really wanted to see in here was the DVD mechanism. The motor here lifts and lowers the drive. But what's interesting is that you can just push the drive shut and it doesn't seem to mind. There's no resistance, no gear train whirring. I was curious how this was possible and it seems to be the work of this little brass gadget here. It's some kind of slip clutch. If you run the motor while holding the door shut, you can see the input spinning while the output stays in place. And likewise, if you push the door closed, you can see that side spins and the motor doesn't. It's a clever little component. Anyway, setting that aside, here's the machine itself. You may notice that the front third is almost empty. This system actually could have been shallower if not for the battery and subwoofer, but otherwise everything fits together quite neatly. The motherboard spans most of the machine, but the ports are on little daughter boards on either side along with the battery connector. Now, while I was getting my bearings in here, I noticed something odd over on the right. There's a little tiny PCB down inside here and it has one of those flat printed antennas. And that seemed odd because we've already found the Bluetooth and the Wi-Fi cards and I've never seen a cellular radio with a printed antenna. There's no reason this machine would have GPS, so what's left? I took a picture of the chip ID, but I didn't figure out what it actually did for a couple of days. I'll tell you about it later. Now, when I first opened this, your eyes may have been drawn to the shocking sight of not just one, but two spinning hard disks. Certainly I wasn't expecting it. It seems like Dell could have fit a three and a half inch drive in here, but they instead went with a pair of 120 gig, 5400 RPM, two and a half inch disks. Now that seems pretty weird, but I think I know why they did it. And I'll talk about it once we're done with the rest of the hardware. For now though, I have to remove those drives because I'm actually in here for a reason. Below the hard drives are the heat sinks and those needed some help urgently, in fact. From what I've heard, I'm lucky that my 2010 works because everywhere I've read, I've heard they like to give up the ghost due to thermal issues, particularly with the graphics. You may have noticed that there's two fans and heat pipes in here because this machine has an actual discrete GPU and a pretty recent one for the time, a Radeon X1800. If we pop off the right side heatsink, we find the graphics module underneath, suffering under some very crusty and unfortunate compound. I scraped off what I could, then I cleaned up the GPU die, but I actually left the stuff that was built up around it because I didn't want to risk ripping off a resistor and I figure none of that should affect cooling. Now, I'd hoped that this would be a desktop GPU, but with the die cleaned off, you can see it is in fact a mobility version. That's still pretty good for the era though, as I'll be showing you shortly. I applied some of my most gamer compound, which ended up being some Arctic Silver 5 from like 10 years ago. And I'm not sure if that'll fix the thermals for good, but hopefully it buys the machine some time. I torqued the bolts back down, probably in the wrong order, and then I turned to the CPU cooler. That of course needed a good scraping as well, but I didn't bother cleaning the CPU because I'm actually going to replace it. I'm generally not one for min-maxing my old PCs. I mean, there were upgrades back in the day, but most people just use them with the parts they came with, and I usually prefer that experience for accuracy. It's the same reason I don't put SSDs in any of my machines. It would be a totally anachronistic experience. But here's the thing. This machine shipped with a Core Duo T2600. Not a Core 2, just a plain core, the original 32-bit version. Now that was at least a true dual core chip and it was smoking hot tech when it came out, but Dell switched to Core 2s as soon as they were available. And since I'd eventually like to try a 64-bit OS on this thing, I decided it wouldn't be inauthentic to upgrade the CPU. I did have a bit of trouble with this though. Earlier that day, I'd pulled a Core 2 Duo T7250 out of a Dell Precision, so I figured I was ready to go. I popped the old Core chip out, dropped the new Core 2 into place, and it wouldn't go in. I seesawed it back and forth, no dice. I checked for bent pins, tried again, no dice, and then an ancient dusty memory came rushing back to me. This CPU socket isn't just yellow for the aesthetics. It actually tells us that this is socket M, the one Intel was using for mobile chips in 06 and early 07. But in May, 2007, they switched to socket P, which is nearly identical, except that it's purple and the key pin has been moved by one position. 
So my 7250 was useless, but I still had the XPS M1210 that I used back in Quick Start Episode 3. Its screen died during the shoot, so I'd planned on throwing it out, but I never got around to it. So I pulled that apart, which was actually far more involved than opening up the M2010, and I was pleased to find a Core 2 Duo T7200 sitting in a socket M. So I pulled that out, dropped it into the M2010, and it went right in. I pasted it up, and I was ready to put everything back together. I fired the machine back up and breathed a sigh of relief when it booted, proving that I hadn't cracked any cores despite my fumbling and poor torque hygiene. Now, however, I had to install Windows XP, and this was not as easy as you'd hope. Now, I have installed XP on literally hundreds of Dells of this vintage. It was my job for a while, but none of them had this kind of hard drive setup. I'm sure a few people noticed this during the boot up earlier, but this machine shipped with a RAID array from the factory. Those two 120 gig drives were pre-configured in RAID 0, or striped, which is very rare for a consumer system, but I suspect I know why they did it. Dell wanted to deliver a fast and responsive machine, and they did. This thing boots pretty quick, even for the time. But more importantly, they wanted it to be able to record a TV broadcast while playing back another one, even possibly while the machine's being used for other tasks, and I'm not sure if any single drive could handle that in this era. I looked up a review of a Seagate 7200 RPM drive from 2005, and the sequential benchmark topped out at 65 megabytes per second in sequential read. They didn't have a random access test, but I ran Crystal Disk Mark on the disk array in this machine, and I got about 75 megabytes per second sequential. I also got 35 and 45 in random access, and if we assume these are proportional, then the Seagate was probably more like 25 to 30. Now, was that actually insufficient for contemporary tasks? I'm not sure, but the point is, Dell was going for high performance with this machine, and while they weren't quite hype enough to throw a WD Raptor in there, it seems like maybe a pair of 5400 RPM drives edged out any single consumer grade disc, probably without a big leap in cost. And I suspect this was more common at the time than I realized. Uh, for instance, the Toshiba Cosmio that I reviewed in Quick Start Episode 5, which was another high-end media center laptop, had two hard drive bays and it supported RAID 0. Toshiba may even have sold it pre-configured that way. I think the lack of affordable SSDs was just really cramping their style in high-end machines and this is just how they dealt with it at the time. Of course, there are many potential problems with RAID. Uh, if I lost one of these drives, I'd lose everything. That sucks. It's also Intel's chipset RAID, which I've always been told is CPU hungry and unreliable. So was it fair of Dell to impose all this extra complexity on consumers without warning them that, hey, this computer is literally half as trustworthy as any other one you can buy? Maybe not, but I don't know what else they could have done. And from the user's perspective, it's pretty much invisible unless it dies or they have to reinstall Windows, neither of which the user would have to do themselves. They would probably take it back to Dell or to a service center of some kind, so it's kind of moot, although it is still a huge pain in the ass for the person repairing it. I admit, it's been a really long time since I installed Windows XP on a RAID controller in anger, well over a decade at this point. Uh, it was always an irritating process, because uh, XP came with very few storage drivers built in, and the way RAID controllers show up to your OS was completely non-standard at this time. Uh, the same goes for early SATA controllers as well. So with any of those, if you wanted to install XP, you had to get a set of drivers on a floppy disk. It had to be a floppy, no USB, no CD, nothing. A floppy disk, and feed that to the setup program. And then like six times out of 10, it just wouldn't work for some reason. You'd have to dick around with it for hours. And that's exactly what happened to me. I spent half a day working on this, trying to install Windows over and over and over. And every time it just said there were no hard drives present. And this was with Dell's own install media, like the exact version that would have come with this PC. So I was getting pretty frustrated. It wasn't until I slept on it and came back in the morning that I remembered people telling me that XP's RAID support was just broken that no matter what you do, it'll never actually install the drivers properly. Even if I'd gotten it to recognize the RAID, it would have done the first half of the install and then rebooted and immediately crashed. The only solution, according to everybody, is to slipstream the drivers, to integrate them into the disk image using a tool like Nlight, and then they'll work both during and after setup. So I had to burn like three different disks before I managed to find the right driver, but in the end, I got it working. Windows installed, and it's been smooth sailing ever since. Now, I can't be sure, but I think that if I'd used Vista, I would have had an easier time of this. But as I said, uh, the machine came with Windows XP and using the original software was important to me, so I put in the effort. And I figured I'd just share in case you ever want to do this yourself. So that's mostly it for the under the hood stuff, but there is one other subject that I've been glossing over. Uh, <laughs> no pun intended. That's uh, the way this thing looks. 
it's not amazing. You've probably seen some hair and dust stuck to it. This is despite my best efforts. I've wiped this thing down multiple times during this shoot, but it barely makes any difference because of course Dell mummified it in soft touch rubber. This is what it looks like after I cleaned it up. When I got this thing, the whole machine looked like a wad of duct tape. There was grit and dirt glued to every inch of the surface. But the fortunate thing about this is that it usually comes off if you put in some effort. The unfortunate thing is that it's a lot of effort. There was so much of this stuff. It was absolutely everywhere and none of the surfaces are flat, so it was just incredibly tedious. I started by applying some paper towels soaked in isopropyl alcohol and after a minute of soaking, I was able to scrape off about two thirds of the stuff with a plastic knife. That felt satisfying, but that remaining third was a nightmare. I spent about eight hours scrubbing it with paper towels and a terry cloth, and I was able to remove about 90, 95% of this crap, but there were parts that were just impossible to get to. And some of the rubber wasn't fully rotted, so it wouldn't lift off. That's what's going on here. This is that rubber crap, but it's still in its original condition, and I just, I have no idea how to get it off without damaging anything. I actually did scuff up the screen bezel trying to get it clean, and that's when I called it quits. So the result is not perfect by any means, but it's far less revolting than it was when I got it. So I have to put this in the W column. Anyway, that's it for the disassembly. Uh, for anyone who skipped it, the hardware summary is as follows. This shipped with a Core Duo T2600 and two gigs of DDR3, but I upgraded those to a Core 2 Duo T7200 and four gigs so I can run Vista comfortably later on. Uh, those are actually accurate specs for the 2007 version of this machine. It also has 802.11g Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, and some mysterious unknown radio board a secret tool we'll talk about later. Then there's a Radeon Mobility X1800 GPU and two 120 gig, 5400 RPM, two and a half inch drives set up in RAID 0 from the factory. Now, by the standards of the time, this was not gonna put Alienware's desktop division out of business, but for a portable machine, it was pretty respectable. I mean, Alienware's laptops were still more impressive, but only because they had dual GPUs in SLI. Otherwise, they were mostly shipping rebranded Clevos with single core AMD Turion CPUs. The M2010 was sold with fairly high-end hardware, especially after the Core 2 refresh, so it's pretty clear that Dell intended this as a gaming machine. Now, I don't usually bother testing much in the way of games in my videos, but I'm usually looking at machines that are more business or multimedia focused. Here though, we definitely wanna see this thing deliver. Now, CNET said that this ran Half-Life 2 Episode 1 at a consistent frame rate, and I don't know what that means, but I won't be double checking because it requires Steam, which no longer runs on XP, and while you can work around this, it is a huge pain, and I don't wanna do it, but I did try their other choice, Prey 2006, and I'm not sure I got the same results that they did. At full resolution, it struggled to reach 30 FPS, and even after I turned it down to 1024 by 768 and put everything on minimum, I had a hard time getting even the opening bathroom scene to do much better than that. Now, I admit that back in these days, I probably would have considered an uneven 30 FPS to be pretty killer performance, and the Doom 3 engine in particular was kind of a miserable, unoptimized mess that doesn't even feel smooth on hardware from 2024, but it was still a bit of a disappointment. It did get me thinking though, Back in the day, I didn't play a lot of cutting edge stuff. I actually hated a lot of the AAA titles of this era. So I picked a game I actually remember enjoying, 2004's Duke Nukem Manhattan Project. In retrospect, I'm not sure why I liked it. It's very simplistic. It's uh, like a Newgrounds flash game with a rudimentary third dimension. And I couldn't actually figure out how to get through the first level, even after like 20 minutes. But it does run like gangbusters at a constant 60 FPS, so this goes in the win column. I then installed Serious Sam's Second Encounter. That game's even older, it's from 2002, but I was still playing it at the time, so here it is. It runs like a million bucks, rarely less than 70 FPS and frequently well over 150. It was getting 15 frames per second at first, but that turned out to be a weird multi-core CPU bug. From there, I turned to a Nantex review of the desktop X1800 to see what was hot at the time. I learned that apparently this was ATI's first card with Shader Model 3, which let it run Splinter Cell Chaos Theory at full detail. So I tried that and, well, it did run, but uh, not nearly as well as it would have on the desktop version, I think. I had to turn a lot of things off and run it at 1024 by 768 to get something remotely usable, and it actually looks smoother on camera than it did in real life. This really felt very shaky, and nothing I did seemed to improve it. 
Far Cry, on the other hand, actually did great. At full resolution with everything on max, it looked like I was getting 60 FPS or better most of the time. There is some very noticeable stuttering, but that didn't seem to be a GPU limitation since decreasing the settings didn't help any. I honestly wonder if running it on Vista might have helped. In any case though, I think this machine would have delivered a perfectly satisfactory Far Cry experience by most people's standards. My final test was Battlefield 2, and I don't have much to say about that. I was able to run it at full resolution on medium settings pretty much fine, so I think this machine passes the test for mid-2000s competitive multiplayer gaming, but it mostly just reminded me how much I don't miss Battlefield 2. That game looks absolutely dreadful. So I didn't try out everything I could think of. I kind of wish I'd tried Fear in particular, but this was a good slice of contemporary popular titles, and mostly it just reminded me how much I don't miss that era of gaming. But this machine did handle them better than I expected. Not as well as I'd hoped, though. In fact, if you really wanted a smooth experience, you might have just been better off playing the games that came with Media Center. I don't remember these being included, maybe they're Dell pack-ins, but it turns out there's two surprisingly charming casual games in here. One called Otto's Magic Blocks, and another called Gem Master, which I expected to be a Bejeweled knockoff, but it's more of a Poyo Pop. But neither of those require a GPU, so Dell surely intended for people to play 3D games on this, and for the price tag, which was, of course, well over $4,000, it really seems like they could have delivered a better experience. I question whether this really needed to be a mobility card. I feel like the chassis has the room for a full-size GPU and the space to cool it, and if Dell was hoping for this to be, you know, the family computer in the living room that's used for games when nobody's watching TV, then a desktop card would have sold that a lot harder. But I suspect that they didn't go that way, mostly because it wouldn't have done very well on battery. So, the battery. It's the weirdest thing about this machine by far. I'm not sure what Dell was picturing anybody doing with it. I mean, that's not to say I can't picture anything. For instance, I took it to a park, I set it on a picnic table, I tuned in some local TV, and I watched it for over an hour on a single charge, which is astonishing for a 20-year-old battery, especially since I was stress testing it. Contemporary reviews cite numbers like three hours of runtime under normal use, and we don't know what that means, but I could believe that they meant TV or movie watching, since that's what this thing was built to do. So Dell didn't just put a battery in here, they put a good one in it. Nonetheless, Hardware Zone put together this delightful chart which graphs runtime to weight ratio on an enormous variety of laptops, and the M2010 scored the absolute worst by a significant margin. The machine does, after all, weigh 18 pounds, almost 9 kilograms. This is a completely absurd weight for a laptop, but of course, it isn't one. It's a portable computer, and those used to weigh 30 pounds on average, so the M2010 is really a featherweight for what it is. Lugging it from place to place isn't the most pleasant experience, but you aren't supposed to take it into Starbucks. I mean, you can, and it actually works a lot better than you'd think, but I doubt it's what Dell intended. But where did they intend this to go? It's a good question. Probably not actually a park, because the screen is basically a mirror and it's not terribly bright. I know I said it was pretty nice, but only by 2006 standards. This is still just a CCFL backlight, so it's usable indoors, but only with a bright image on the screen. Dark, low contrast video is really tough to see, even under household lighting, and I found that most games were unplayable unless I pumped the gamma. So outdoors TV viewing isn't really on the table. I mean, it is literally on the table, but you can't see what it's doing there. One thing I can imagine that holds some water is media portability in an era before streaming. Given that you'd notionally record TV on this thing, it's one way to cart your backlog of Grey's Anatomy to a friend's house before the days of Plex. And while the array of video outputs will let you plug into just about anything they might have had, the screen is big enough that you could also just plunk it down on a coffee table and use it as is without having to mess with your friend's TV wiring. 
but that still doesn't fully explain the purpose of the battery. The only thing I can think of is that it serves as a kind of micro UPS. If you do have it in a precarious spot, like the middle of a living room, it wouldn't do to have someone trip over a power cord, but if that happens here, you just get yourself untangled and plug it back in, no harm done. But I can't imagine that's what Dell was picturing. I think I get why they made the machine this big, why they developed the novel peripherals, why they put so many ins and outs on it, why it has two hard drives. I can see the arguments for all of these strange things, but this one element I just don't get. I can see some weird edge cases where it might be convenient, but they're nerd shit. <laughs> this isn't stuff that would justify to a normal consumer compromising the rest of the machine just to accommodate it. I think this machine would make a lot more sense as an ordinary all-in-one with a desktop CPU and a GPU that just happens to have a carrying handle built in. So, as is usually the big question in my videos, how did this happen? Well, to me, this feels like the product of a Skunk Works, an internal team given free reign to produce whatever they wanted, no matter how outlandish or expensive, as long as it made Dell look like innovative market leaders. This is, for what it's worth, the environment that produced the original IBM PC, so it's a venerable idea. Sony must have been doing it all the time, what with the nonstop parade of weird VIOs they put out, many of which couldn't possibly have been responses to market research or focus testing. Someone just had an idea, a vision, and they were allowed to make it reality with very little oversight. And I think that's what happened here. Juicero style flexes like the huge aluminum monitor arm and the massively overbuilt top panel latch suggest a blank check was involved somewhere. But honestly, I can't decide if this design really is completely out of left field or if it's all the way at the other end, a Homer Simpson bubble car that combines every imaginable consumer request into a compromise of epic proportions. It has to be high power and big enough to see from across the room, and it has to play games, but it also has to be portable and run off a battery and be fully controllable from the kitchen and so on and so forth. I think overall the result is impressive, but if I have a specific criticism, it's that it's doing so much that you can miss some of the real innovations. I call this the curse of the concept car. Let's go back to this remote control for a moment. This thing is intriguing. This was made under contract by Gyration, who went on to sell it themselves as the Air Music Remote with a slightly different aesthetic, slightly different button layout, and a standalone USB receiver. But it didn't get released until two years later, and I can't really see any reason for that. You see, I actually have the gyration version of this remote. I bought this because I couldn't find the Dell one with a receiver on eBay. But as I learned, this is because the Dell ones didn't have a receiver. They work with one that's built into the M2010. It's that weird unidentified radio board that we found. That chip was a CYW USB 6934. That's a wireless USB controller and it does exactly what it says on the tin. It's literally just USB over radio. This was brand new technology at the time uh, and it only survived until about 2009 for some reason. I have no idea why it failed because while it was around, it got used in a few things that I own and it seems to work just fine. We saw it back in Quick Start Episode 6. It's how the Dell Latitude Z600's wireless dock worked, and I could run USB devices, audio, and display link video up to like 25 feet off of it. So it seems like a solid technology. I'm not really sure what happened there. At any rate, though, the remote is able to have all the functionality that I showed you earlier because it is just a USB device. There's just a radio in between it and the USB port. I wasn't able to work out where this appeared in the device tree, but I'm sure it's a composite of several HID interfaces. The weird thing about this, though, is that the Gyration branded version seems to be the exact same thing. The USB receiver has the exact same chip in it, it just won't work with the Dell remote and vice versa. Now obviously they could have firmware differences, but I don't see why that should matter. Wireless USB was a standard, so both of these should speak the same language. Presumably there were no real differences, they just deliberately locked this to the Dell receiver because they wanted the remote to be an exclusive feature of the M2010. I think that Dell themselves designed this remote, then had Gyration build it with a two-year exclusivity agreement so people couldn't look past the computer that they'd put so much work into and just buy the remote itself. To wit, this actually happened. People realized that they could buy the Dell receiver boards, wire them up to USB cables, and then use the remotes with normal PCs. So they did, and it seems like once Dell noticed a curious rise in the sale of spare parts, they took the receivers off their website. But I think this concern made sense because this remote is not really a product. It's an integral component of the M2010. It's not just something Gyration was working on that Dell licensed. I think Dell actually commissioned it from them. And I have two facts supporting this. 
First, there's the screen. When I held this thing up and showed off the Media Center interface, you probably thought to yourself, wow, Dell just shamelessly ripped off the iPod UI, didn't they? But that's probably not true. This interface is actually closer to that of the Dell Digital Jukebox, a series of MP3 players Dell sold for several years, which were in turn developed by Creative based on their own Jukebox series. And from a legal perspective, that's the real origin of the iPod interface, at least per the settlement Apple reached with Creative in 2006. Now, regardless of whether Creative really had the right side of that dispute, there's no way that Gyration would have developed this on their own in that legal atmosphere. Dell, on the other hand, probably had the rights to the Creative UI via their existing partnership. So they went to Gyration and said, just put our media player interface right into the thing. And that's what they did. Or more accurately, it's what D2M Design did. This is our second piece of the puzzle. These are the people who actually designed the Air Music Remote and per their website, they designed it in collaboration with Gyration for Dell, specifically to pair with the M2010, which we now learn was once codenamed the Media Mogul. I found that term used elsewhere, so if you had any doubt that this was a multimedia focused machine, that should put it to bed. They also outright state that they cloned the Wiimote, and that was probably safer than you'd think, since Gyration was patenting gyro controllers almost 15 years before Nintendo, but I digress. Here's what I'm driving at. I had never heard of the Gyration Air Music before. Like I said, I've never seen an ad for it, and it doesn't seem like a lot sold. There are very few on eBay, even fewer with receivers included, and if mine is any indication, those that are out there probably don't work anymore. And this is both sad and strange, because from the feature set, I'd have expected this to sell like hotcakes, even in 2008. I don't think this model looks quite as good as Dell's, but that hardly matters. The functionality is amazing, and clearly people were excited enough to go out of their way to scam them out of Dell. On top of that, this one even has enhanced functions. It supports controlling more devices over IR. So it really seems like lots of home theater enthusiasts would have gone nuts for this thing if they knew it existed, and that makes me think that they just didn't. Dell didn't sell or even advertise their remote because while they came up with a brilliant product that enthusiasts would have loved, it wasn't really a product. It was a component of a machine sold as an experience, a package deal, and one that almost no enthusiast would have wanted. So maybe Dell let Gyration keep the trimmings after they were done with this pork chop, but since they didn't have anywhere near the marketing clout, I think it just died on the vine. And that's the curse of the concept car. A company puts together a product that's not really something they ever intend to make, it's just there to get coverage in the media and make them look clever and innovative. Lexus makes a car with a heads up display and thermal imaging and all this other wild stuff, but the real hero feature is that it can turn into a boat. And that's obviously absurd. I mean, yes, they can make one. They have a skunk works, produce a prototype, they show it driving into a lake, it really is doing it, but obviously they're never going to mass produce that. You'll see a couple TV ads, you'll get linked to a YouTube video, and then they crush the prototypes into cubes and throw them into a volcano. And the heads up display and the thermal imaging go with it. They're trapped in the amphibious sports car. They will probably go down with the ship. Any idea that's invented as part of a publicity stunt is likely to live and die in that stunt. And I think that's what happened to this remote. Remote. It may have been made by Dell, but that doesn't mean that Dell's normal computer division had any access to it. Once the M2010 finished its run, the whole thing went into some dusty vault, never to see the light of day again. And we can probably say the same thing about several other aspects of this machine. I wish that Dell had gone harder with the detachable keyboard, for instance. This thing is really neat, and they could have included it with more conventional all-in-one machines, still using the docking system so you don't have to keep putting new batteries in it, but with full travel keys and a normal layout. I also think the uh, dual articulated hinge is pretty cool, and this could have scaled to other machines, but it didn't really show up again in anything else for years and wasn't made nearly as well when it finally did. And the high quality sound system, this could have fit into a lot of other machines. I find it more impressive than any other laptop speaker system I've ever heard, but all of this got trapped in the M2010, which is, albeit an impressive accomplishment and a solid product, nonetheless, one that only a small sliver of the market was ever going to make room for in their lives. It's a concept car that got put into production, and that's always kind of a tragedy. I mean, if we want to talk about missing the trees for the forest, the funniest thing about this machine is that you can get so distracted by all the punchy features and wild design choices that you can completely miss the fact that it actually has a quick start OS. How's that for a late reveal? Not much of one though, because we've actually seen this before. If you haven't watched the Quick Start series, which I recommend, it's my best work by far, I'll just summarize. 
In the mid 2000s, a bunch of system vendors started delivering dual boot PCs to consumers where the primary OS was Windows, but the second OS was something much smaller, like a stripped down copy of Linux, so that theoretically the machine could boot up faster if you weren't planning on doing anything more involved than playing a movie or looking at email. The whole joke of the series though is that few or none of these solutions really worked. They either didn't improve startup time, or not enough to matter, or they were just so useless that there was no point. And this one's all three. It's called Dell Media Direct, and it's a clone of Windows Media Center made by Cyberlink. I covered this in Quick Start Episode 3, and that was really the dumbest entry in the series because this isn't even really a second OS. It's XP Embedded. That's right, Dell shipped two different copies of Windows XP on the same machine. So as you'd expect, it takes almost exactly the same amount of time to boot, rendering this all utterly pointless. And since the software isn't actually Windows Media Center, half the features are missing. You can't watch live TV, for instance. To its credit, since the wireless USB remote doesn't need drivers to function, it actually does work here. On Dell's other machines with MediaDirect, you just had to use the keyboard, but that's all moot since you'd never use this on purpose. My guess is that Dell just included it because, well, technically this is an XPS laptop, and at this time, all of those were getting MediaDirect, but including it on the machine that shipped with striped hard drives, probably the fastest boot time in their entire product range, is really just the cherry on top, reminding us that no corporation can go 10 minutes without making a really dumb decision. But in conclusion, I still like the M2010. It's pretty well built, and I think that the very specific audience that it targeted would have loved it. I never would have been in that audience, but I think it did exist. It's somebody with a house much prettier and cleaner than mine, with a lot more empty surfaces that they can park things like this on. I think people who can live like that would have adored this thing. I mean, to wit, I picked it up from somebody who said their dad had only just stopped using it and was sad to see it go. Now, I do admit that I'm being generous here. I'm sugarcoating where I'm not cherry picking. I, I know the machine is a bit sillier than I'm giving it credit for, but isn't this what we want to see for the corporations that we depend on for all of our stuff, however involuntarily, to just sometimes let some artists make a strange thing just in case it hits our particular needs? I know there's someone watching who would love to own one of these if it had an i5 fourth gen in it, but honestly, if you just wanted a fancy video player for a small bedroom, these apparently did start shipping with Blu-ray drives a bit later on. So with Windows 7 and an updated media center, I bet you could get a pretty nice Blu-ray and TV viewing experience out of this thing, even now. I won't be testing that though, because this video is long enough already. So, Thank you for sticking with me. I know that was a lot, but I realized that if I didn't cover this my way, nobody was going to. If you enjoyed this video, then consider subscribing to my channel so I know you're into this sort of thing. Maybe turn on notifications if you want to find out when I upload new things, but if you really want to help me out, then consider subscribing to my Patreon like these folks here. My entire budget for weird stuff like this comes from viewers like you. I haven't seen one of these things in the wild since about 2009, so when this one popped up, I just had to grab it at the sticker price. No time for bartering or bargaining, so I paid more than I wish I had for it, but thanks to my patrons, I could do that. So I'm incredibly grateful to all of them for making this possible. I can't thank you all enough, and to everyone else, thanks for watching.